the idea is really simple. The idea is to capture rainwater where it falls and sequester that water into the soil. I mean, if you could capture rainwater where it falls so that you could stop soil erosion and all the phosphates and fertilizers that attach themselves to soil and run down the river and run through the creeks and run down the Mississippi and end up in the Gulf of Mexico in the warm water and then the sun hits it and we have a big algae bloom and millions of fish are killed. So farmers in Louisiana are mad as hell at farmers in Iowa. And we think, well, that's an act of God. You know, what can we do about that? Uh, I don't think it's an act of God. I think there are ways we can do things differently. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about uh, is this scary thing. We're 7 billion people on this planet. And if you look at the chart from 1000 BC to about 1000 AD there, things were pretty good for us. I mean, there was a lot of land. We didn't have a lot of population growth. Uh, we managed to kill ourselves off occasionally with diseases and famine and uh, wars and regional conflicts. But our population stayed really level for a long time. And then look what happened all of a sudden. We have this tremendous explosion in our population. There are a lot of reasons for this sudden burst in our population. But one of the key reasons we've seen this effect is the success of agriculture. When you start thinking about agriculture and how we've improved our productivity in a very short period of time, the last 150 years, it's, it's real easy to see if you think about it this way. If you think about Henry Ford and the advances that he made in rapid production systems, and he sat down and he had a beer with Mr. Standard Oil. And we have cheap oil, and now we have mechanization and mass production. Before too long at the barbecue, here comes Mr. Moline and Mr. Deer. Then Mr. Case comes, and Mr. IH comes, Mr. New Holland comes. Before you know it, only 2% of our population in this country today produce all the food for the rest of us. That frees all of us up to use all of our productive energy to do all the amazing things we do. Walmart, Lady Gaga, all these great advances that we've done. It's because of the success of agriculture. But we're at a point now where we're going to have to do something about this population issue. Do we have the natural resources on this planet? to support seven billion. Well, we do because we're all here, we're getting ready to have lunch. So we know so far so good. But if we add another three billion by 2050, you know, that conversation has been going around and it goes around in people's homes. Are we gonna survive? Is the planet gonna implode? What's gonna happen to us? You know, it's a scary thing. Uh, my granddaughter uh, attends Purdue University, and uh, um, uh, I worry about her and her future. It's that generation that's going to have to wrestle with some of these really tough issues. Um, I'm one that believes we can. This planet can support it. But we're going to have to reevaluate how we're using the resources on the planet. That comes down to decisions we make individually. And I want to talk about that a little bit. The three global drivers for the next 50 years are going to be soil, water, and energy. These issues and the problems related to the last slide are going to make religious conflicts, regional conflicts, political conflicts absolutely seem small compared to the problem that we have related to these issues. Water, of course, is a key issue in the world. Nobody knows that better than Iowa. They grow so much food and they feed so many people. But water is a really critical issue. The demand for water is rising so rapidly. I was in Hanzhou, China about 36 hours ago. And uh, I've been to China a number of times. 
Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to take my wife, Connie, with me this time. And uh, uh, the consumption in China is amazing. The economy is growing so fast. We were going down a six-lane highway, brand new, not a cigarette butt to be seen anywhere, beautiful lighting. And I turned to my wife and I said, these are our tax dollars at work because that's where our money is right now. But I also found out that 1.4 billion Chinese, they like to eat a little Kentucky Fried Chicken on Sunday just like we do. So who are we to deny other societies and emerging economies not to have the kinds of things that we do? Soil is the critical issue, I think, as much or more so than water. In the last 150 years, we've lost about a third of our topsoil on this planet through mechanized agriculture. We feed a lot of people, but we do so at a very severe cost. Generally, there's about six inches of good topsoil on the planet. So, so far, we've lost about a third of that. If we keep doing things for the next 50 years the way we've done them for the last 50 years, there's not going to be any topsoil. Then we're going to have problems that are unsolvable, in my opinion. So we need to find ways to address this issue the availability, and the fertility. You know, right now, about 70% of the fertility that's going into crop production in this country is artificial. It's not natural fertility in the soil. It's a result of nitrogen. It's a result of oil. It's a result of carbon-based fuels. We're also coming into this time of peak oil. Oil is a fixed asset, and we've reached about the point where there's not a lot left. We can drill. We'll find some more, but it's going to just delay the problem that we're facing in terms of how we're going to feed ourselves. So these are the drivers of the next 50 years, and these are the things we need to be talking about with regards to how we can improve it. Um, yeah, it's about lunchtime. I don't know how that slide got up there. Uh, but but it, it goes to the issue of our innovation. Imagine if you took a cup of syrup and you poured it on a pancake. It doesn't take long for that to run off. But if you take that same cup of syrup and you pour it on a waffle, all the syrup stays on the top of the waffle. Now, if you're like me when you're eating your McDonald's pancakes and you pour the syrup over the top, that top pancake is so good. But then there's no syrup on the next one and there's no syrup on the last one. But on a waffle, that syrup soaks down in all the way through. So we got to thinking about the relationship between soil and water. What if you could have the rain falling on the land, but it fell on land that looked like a waffle so that it didn't run off? That's a great idea. But for the last 5,000 years, farmers everywhere have tried to solve this problem. How do you have a fine seed bed for good seed soil contact without the inherent problem of soil erosion? And we've been battling this battle for a long time. We've been losing this battle quite a bit in the last 150 years. So what if we could find a way to do this? What if pancakes and waffles were the key to survivability on our planet? I want to talk about the innovation itself a little bit. There she is. This is called a Terra Star. I don't know what else to call it. I don't like to call it the brand name because I want to support the brand of, of Ted in the way that Ted doesn't want to promote commercialism. I understand that. Uh, but we've, been, we've invented an object here. And this object came about through a lot of what other presenters have been talking about, trial and error. Uh, I went to a friend uh, who's an airline pilot and an aeronautical engineer, and I said, if I wanted to fly a plane under the ground, what would that do to the soil? And uh, he got into a long discussion with me about, well, there's lift on the wings, and that creates vo uh, vortexes in the air. And he said, you know, if you, if you could do that, 
you could break down the soil's bulk density, the compaction in the soil, and let more carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen get into this root zone, and you're going to have healthier plants. You know, what a cool idea. Uh, I had another friend who was a marine engineer. He built boats, and I asked him the same thing. If I were going to move a boat in soil, if I wanted to move, how would I do it? He said, you do want to do it with a sailboat. You want to prow, and you want that prow going into the soil, and it's going to do something to the soil that's never been done before. You know, all of our equipment and all of our tractors all push weight down on the soil, and it compacts the soil. But if you go through the soil this way, as you're going through the soil, you actually end up moving the soil laterally. And if this wheel is moving it this way, and another wheel next to it is moving it the other way, they're starting to rub the soil in between them. And the effect that you have is if you take a hard clot of dirt and you put it in your hand, and you put your other hand on top of it, and you hold it up, and you start doing this, within a few minutes, the dirt gets loose. It starts falling between you. So there is a pressure point there that this works in. And if you gather up the loose soil, and you put it in your hand, and then you just squeeze it the right amount, take your hand off, it stays together. And if you have a seed in the middle of that, then you're going to get all of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that seed needs to make a healthy plant. That's all we got to do. How do we do that? Uh, we looked at steel for this, but steel compacts the soil. Uh, we looked at wood. Wood compacts the soil. We looked at rubber. Uh, Goodrich said of the 36 qualities you want, uh, we can make about 32 of them. But some of this stuff you can't really do in rubber right now. Well, you could do it, but it would be so expensive you couldn't afford to make it work. So we found a plastic that didn't exist 50 years ago. MIT developed a class of plastics, and this is one of them that's been tweaked a little bit so that it has the same effect. As it's going into the soil, it has a flex to it so that it doesn't compact the soil. This wheel will not compact the soil. It will collapse within itself before it compacts the soil. We can make a wheel that'll do five acres. Or we can make a wheel that'll do 250,000 acres. So how long a wheel lasts, that's more of a marketing decision. What we want to talk about a little bit is how it works. We've talked about it on our slide. Um, it's, it's an amazing concept. If you look at this, Think about the amount of efficiency we're losing in crop production worldwide as a result of ponding. Do you ever think about that? You know, you drive by the fields this fall, and everyone's harvesting their corn, but you see these little pockets of green corn and green, and, and green beans still out in the field. Why? Because when the rain fell, it washed down together, that soil stayed wet, and those crops stayed green. But what if all of the water that fell stayed where it was at and it didn't run down and create ponding? Well, all of that could be harvested at the same time. So increasing efficiency in production of crops is critical. This is a picture of what happens when you can achieve this effect. This is in central Mexico, uh, the state of Queretaro. Uh, it's about uh, 5,000 feet elevation. They get 18 inches of rain a year. It's a semi-arid area. And previous to this, when they did get the rain and the ground was hard, the water washed away immediately. But whenever we start using the TerraStar effect, you can begin seeing how the moisture begins sequestering in the soil, just like money in the bank if you've got a savings account. You put the money in, you put the money in. The day comes along, you need money. If you had a savings account, you're safe. You go and you get it out. Plants are the same way. It's not that we don't get enough rainfall to grow our crops generally. I know in Indiana, uh, they use about 37 inches of rain to grow corn. Actually, corn doesn't need 37 inches of rain. 
If you get 27 inches of rain, you can grow great corn. If the plant has access to the water when the plant needs it. And that's always a problem for farmers. Either the rain doesn't come when they need it, or the rain comes when they don't need it. If we could control the variability of how rain is applied to our plants, we can make a lot of difference. Um, I, I see this all over the world. It's a common problem. And I can tell you climate change, regardless of the cause, uh, I see the effects of climate change worldwide in agriculture. And in Iowa and in Ohio and in Indiana, when we don't get the amount of rain we need and our crops don't do as well, uh, there's an economic impact from that. In Kenya, if the rains don't come in October, November, and December, then people starve in January, February, and March. That's how serious it is. And the changes in global rain patterns are becoming critical. So a technology that can capture all the rain and put it in the soil, you're structuring the soil so that the water by its weight will eventually get down into the subsoil, run into creeks. So it's a different way of managing water. The result of this is very interesting. You can tell the obvious difference between crops. Both of these crops are crops that were planted side by side in the same field. Uh, the one on the left are bean plants in Mexico. The one on the right are corn roots from China. The only difference between these crops is the use of an imprint wheel. No changes in fertilizer. In fact, the beans had no fertilizer because they can't afford fertilizer. Uh, the corn was the same way. Everything was the same except the imprint wheel was used on the ones that are larger and more successful. This technology increases surface area by 30%. That means you have 30% more opportunity to capture and store water. You have 30% more opportunity to attract moisture, to attract sun, carbon, hydrogen into the soil. It reduces soil erosion. This is a, a demonstration we gave for the National Farm Bureau Federation in Waco, Texas a few years ago. Uh, the video is not very long. You can see it on our website. But it shows how this side, the left side, that soil was prepared as the guy was getting ready to plant his corn. That's the conventional. On the other side is the imprint side. And this goes on for about uh, 14, 15 minutes. The bucket on your left fills up. It overruns. But the water never gets down to the other side.